Good morning, everyone. So Good morning. Amy, Good morning. Amy asked me about a month ago if I would like to have the opportunity to share the sermon on one Sunday. And I'm happy to be with you today as we continue to move through the Gospel of John in 2014. So our passage for today is the story of Jesus' first miracle, or when he attends a wedding banquet and turns water into wine. So earlier this week, I stumbled upon a list of different words of the English language and how their meaning has completely changed over the years. So sorry if you would. So the first word I came up with would be the word angel. So when most of us think of the word angel, we think of a benevolent winged thing, figure sent from God, while the original meaning of the word was actually any messenger or hireling of any kind. Today we use the term all describe something nasty or unpleasant, when it originally meant awe filled or something that inspires awe or wonder. Then there's the word bully, which we think of as an oppressor of the weak, but originally meant a good fellow or a darling. With some of these, I can sort of see how they were stretched to be changed as time went on, while others seem to have taken a complete 180. This got me thinking about my own thoughts on daily events, like bedtime, for instance. At age six, it was something to be dreaded and ran away from. Now, after working an 11-hour day, it's something that I look forward to and seems to be creeping earlier and earlier. <laughs> Back to the Gospel, I've always heard this story as an example of how cool Jesus is. It's a party, right? And Jesus makes it an even better one with this particularly nifty parlor trick. But this story and the miracle in it has a lot of interesting details that are fascinating to think about. As the story begins, you can almost feel the awkward moment when Mary approaches Jesus and bluntly says, they have no more wine. <laughs> After his response, Mary tells the servants to do whatever he tells you, and you can almost picture Mary walking away with a wink and a nod. <laughs> One thing that stands out to me is the reluctance that Jesus has when he tells her, my time has not yet come. The only other time we really see reluctance in Jesus is when he is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane when he knew he was awaiting his death. Mm -hmm. The Bible passage also gives an accurate description of just how much water Jesus was working with here. Six stone water jars holding 20 to 30 gallons is over 150 gallons of water. This is no small glass of champagne, but an entire store's worth of spirits created by God Almighty. Mm -hmm. So why did God choose this moment to serve <coughs> as the beginning of Jesus' ministry? And what does that have to say about the kingdom of God? When we follow Jesus through the Gospels, we see that he occasionally gets frustrated by people's needs and demands for a miracle or a sign that he really is the Messiah. Jesus becomes annoyed when people look for a show more than hearing his message, but he is often moved to heal the sick or feed the hungry out of compassion for them. So food and healing are really practical and important, but more wine? As glorious as wine might be, it doesn't seem quite as important or as life-saving. One of the influential teachers in my life has been a man named Bruxy Cady, who is a Brother in Christ pastor in Toronto, Toronto, Canada. So he has authored a book called The End of Religion, in which he argues that Jesus came to end all religions forever, replacing them with himself. Bruxy believes that Jesus was something of an irreligious agitator who upset not only the political figures, but the religious leaders so much that they executed him. But beyond that, Jesus reflects a God who is less interested in ritual and circumstance and prioritizes relationship and personal understanding. So perhaps this idea provides a clue for why turning water into wine was so significant and not just a favor to make for a better wedding reception. If you dig a bit deeper into the Jewish customs of the day, the water in these large casks was not simply used for drinking, but as a way to clean and cleanse oneself before food was taken in, as per many of the rules and laws created by the Pharisees to enhance their own holiness and closeness to God. This is the same type of purification ritual that priests and Levites needed to use before entering the temple. And if you were unclean, a week full of prayerful repentance was often required before you could resume your duties. In the story of the Good Samaritan, we learn of how a man of an outside ethnic group helped another who was robbed, beaten, and naked, while multiple religious teachers passed him by. 
It's natural to think that the teachers and leaders should be the first ones on the ground to help. But then they wouldn't have been able to do their priest jobs. They were simply doing what they thought was right by their belief system and what helped them to stay in the right with God. Luckily, this is one of the first things that Jesus completely turns on his head. Back to our friends at the wedding banquet, the cleansing water is turned into wine. A liquid that was once used to clean and make new is now used to drink and enjoy. What a symbolic turnaround. This will not be the first time that Jesus refers to the kingdom of God as a wedding banquet, as later in the Gospels he continually refers to himself as the groom, preparing a place for his bride and heaven itself as a great banquet for all those that he loves. With the wedding feast already being prepared, love is given importance over purity, joy over prudence, and the fellowship of all people over barriers and structures that divide people by class, race, or ability. In this story, we see even more of the qualities of Jesus come into play. He doesn't draw attention to himself, as Jesus isn't given credit for this really amazing feat. Rather, the master of the banquet commends the bridegroom for bringing out such terrific we see this again later in Jesus' ministry, when the lame man by the pool and the hemorrhaging woman are healed by Jesus, and he turns it back to them, saying, your faith has healed you. If Jesus came to replace elements of Hebrew tradition with himself, such as the law of Moses and traditions of animal sacrifice, then so too he came to replace the ways that we self-purify, not through water, but through him. The order of things is changing and the ways that power is structured in God's new world. Just as the last are to be first in the new kingdom, the best wine is saved till the end. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a coincidence that near the end of his ministry, Jesus again sits down for a meal with his disciples and raises a glass of wine, saying, Take this cup and drink. It is my blood shed for you. Wine is what is given to those who attend the wedding banquet, and it is the blood of Christ. Just as, a, as words in our language and our attitude about certain experiences change, so Jesus started his ministry by completely changing what following God is all about. That if we are asking the question of what brings us salvation or eternal life, then perhaps it is Jesus that we need in our life, and not purity or strong love, abidance to a law. If we are asking the question of how to follow Jesus now, then perhaps empowering others to live their lives and sharing the hospitality of a wedding feast is a good place to start. Mm -hmm.